Hello, welcome to Next Gen. Uh, today is Pivoting with Purpose with my friend Jim Davis, coming to us from Washington State. Um, he is a superintendent and educator, as, and uh, in his later life became a consultant, helping uh, leaders of all type uh, lead from what is sacred to them. And he wrote a book called Sacred Leadership. So uh, he's going to be talking to us about pivoting with purpose, and I'm going to uh, turn this over to him. If you have questions, feel free to put them into chat. Linda is going to be monitoring chat, and will um, uh, at the appropriate time either interrupt Jim or uh, and have you speak or um, ask the question in a group. You know, sort of uh, at the appropriate time. So Jim, the floor is yours. All right. Thanks, Tom. Uh, I'm coming to you live. I think I'm alive. Um, <laughs> outside of okay. Hall, Washington. It's a large metropolis of 3,800 people at the foot of the Cascade Mountains. And uh, this is a place where social distancing is a way of life before COVID-19. Uh, we we uh, rarely see people where we are. Um, and so you're all welcome to come visit anytime. Um, this is Juneteenth, uh, and it, it marks the, um, the day that, uh, that Texas found out, the Texas slaves found out that they were actually free uh, two years after the Emancipation Proclamation. And I think it's appropriate that we're talking about pivoting with purpose on this day because that was a major pivot for those in Texas, but also a major pivot for the United States. And it shows that pivoting is difficult, Pivoting takes time, uh, but pivoting with purpose allows uh, for resilience for us to, um, to get where we want to go. Tom asked me to spend about 20 minutes talking with you about pivoting with purpose today and then open it up to questions and discussion. And I'm gonna try to stick to that timeline uh, and make sure that people are, are free to go uh, at, after 45 minutes like Tom promised. Um, I'm going to switch now and uh, share my screen. You won't have to look at my face. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Perfectly. Okay, great. And if you don't mind muting yourselves, I'd appreciate it. I took care of that. Um, for today's discussion, I just want to, uh, to show you how I'm using terms as they, uh, since I'm presenting, I get to set the, the definition for today. Uh, mission, and uh, in today's context, that's the product or service you're offering your, your customers or clients, the what. Purpose, it uh, describes why we are in this business and how does it serve a greater good. And then values describe the standards of behavior, uh, the how, especially in relationship to others. Uh, so you can run a business uh, that is values-based, where you respect your customers, you're honest, you operate with integrity, or you can operate in a different way. Uh, so when I talk, I don't want to get these things confused. Um, Often people talk, see mission and purpose as the same thing. Today I'm trying to, to separate those just slightly. Um, several of you, I noticed, were uh, participating in last week's presentation in which Carol spoke about how to get out of the muck uh, and to face the fear that most of us face when uh, we find ourselves or our theme uh, looking at purpose today. Uh, during Carol's presentation, uh, Jim Gitney, who was one of the participants, shared that he had recently met with a group of CEOs who expressed fear of the unknown future they are facing. And I think most of us can, can relate to that fear, as, especially uh, as businesses were shut down and, and it was unknown where we were going. Um, we're aware that we're, our country's kind of in a trifecta of crisis. Uh, we're facing a health crisis, a financial crisis, and a cultural crisis at the moment. And I think if we put our heads together, we could probably come up with a few more crises uh, to add to the list. Um, 
there's certainly no shortage of issues that, that you as business owners and entrepreneurs need to deal with. And um, what I'm proposing today is that whatever pivoting you need to do, make sure that you take your purpose with you. Um, the why, what is important to you, uh, and, and how does that help you stay focused on, on the future? Um, during times like these, it's easy to go to lack, to problems, the loss of opportunity. However, then rather than see these crises as obstacles to overcome, I like to think of them as opportunities to pivot, uh, to reconsider what's important to us as individuals, business owners, and executives. And I'm going to share a personal story that illustrates what I mean. Um, in 1997, I walked away from a 27 year career in K-12 education. I was a school superintendent at the top of my game, uh, but I was deeply dissatisfied and I felt disconnected from the purpose that drew me into education in the first place. Um, it was a tough time for me. Uh, I found that instead of really focusing on the kids and the education, I spent my time primarily focused on budgets, union negotiations, HR issues, community meetings, politics at the local, state, and federal levels. I found myself spending 60 to 70 hours working on things unrelated to my purpose. It took me months of introspection to get clear. I didn't want to disappoint my supportive school board, my teachers and staff, or the community of parents and students who had so graciously supported me over the years. However, I realized I needed to pivot. Now, I didn't call it pivoting in 1997, but I ended up giving two weeks notice and walked out the door, uh, giving up salary, medical benefits, most of my pension, as well as professional prestige, and even a few friends. Now, it certainly wasn't the most gracious uh, exit, but that's how it went. Uh, and uh, I needed to reconnect with my purpose. It became clear that I wanted to work in a positive environment that provided the opportunity to leverage my skills in support of future clients that I did not have. Uh, this pivot also needed to provide ample time for personal growth, continuous learning, which is very important to me personally, and leisure time with my family. Uh, that work needed to reflect not only my greater purpose, but also my values of integrity, respect for others, compassion, and honesty. I try to live my life by those four values. With purpose in mind, I pivoted. As Tom said at the beginning, I formed my own corporation that grew into an international consulting firm. I worked with nonprofits, public sector, and several Fortune 500 companies. Uh, now, after 23 years, I choose to spend some of my time working with a select group of young entrepreneurs. I do that on a pro bono basis, uh, but most of my time I spend rehabilitating my 25 acres of forest and wetlands with my wife. Only Tom Reynolds could get me out of the forest for this presentation. Uh, this is looking out uh, across the wetland, and the pond you see is a beaver pond. and um, that's part of our, our 25 acres of forest. Now I'm sharing this example of my, my personal journey um, because it shows how if we allow our values and our purpose can happen by focusing on those two things, my purpose and my values, I was able to conquer my own fear of starting a new company in a new field uh, in order to live a better life. Uh, for myself and my family. And then hopefully I think for my clients as, as the business built. I don't think I'm alone um, as one who's experienced the disconnect uh, that many people feel between purpose and their work. Uh, far too often companies uh, see their employees as a resource to be used rather than a source of their success and profits. And so as, as we go forward, I'm going to share with you um, some, some information and some examples of companies who have moved uh, with purpose and pivoted with purpose. 
And I just got a note that my internet connection is unstable. Uh, and so am I. Um, May 7th, 2020, uh, Harris Poll did uh, a questionnaire of people asking what was going on in their lives related to COVID-19. 80% of the respondents said they would remember which companies did the right thing by their workers in dealing with safety measures or efforts to avoid layoffs. That's telling you something about where the general population is right now. Three quarters of them said they wouldn't forget those businesses that took missteps even long after the crisis ends. Uh, think about that in your own business um, line of work. Um, and what I'd like to do is take a few seconds now, and if you would, in the chat, bo chat box, um, answer this question, how are you doing the right thing by your employees? If you can just, uh, I'll give you a few seconds here and before we go on, and if you can type that into the chat. We're just checking out our internet out here. Everyone feel free to go into the chat by clicking on the chat bubble at the bottom of your screen and share some examples of what you're doing right now with your employees. I know we have people who have everything who are everything from manufacturing to professional services, who have teams that are remote and so on. While you're thinking about that, um, we'll move on. And don't be afraid to put it in the chat box. I, I saw last, uh, last week it took several minutes for people to finally uh, share. If we can, I'd like to, while you're thinking about that, delve a little deeper into this concept of purpose. Um, Hubert Jolie is a former CEO of Best Buy, and uh, I just saw an interview with him uh, done by McKinsey and Company. And he built a reputation over, over the years in the business world as probably one of the most visible advocates of focusing on social purpose and seeing people as the guiding light in business. And that's not usually how we think about a CEO of a major company. Um, I, I have one that comes to mind uh, that I consulted with in a Fortune 100 company and his typical way of looking at his employees was as people who were disposable. In fact, he came up through sales, became CEO and then fired his father uh, who had gotten him the job in the first place. Uh, so Jolie is a, is a very different kind of CEO. Uh, he became the CEO of Best Buy in uh, 2012, uh, and he engineered a dramatic turnaround of that company. I don't know if you recall, but they were headed towards bankruptcy. And he, he really took time to talk to his employees. He decided not to deal with the problem by firing people, but rather by reimagining, by pivoting the company, while still bringing those employees and a strong sense of purpose along with him. Uh, he did interesting things. For instance, he looked at his competitors. Amazon was seen as a competitor. What did he do? He brought them into a store. Apple was seen as a competitor. He brought them into a store. And over time, Best Buy had stores within a store with everybody who was seen as their competitors. And the company had a, a great turnaround. Now, Jolie calls this leading with noble purpose. And he says that noble purpose is at the intersection of these four things. What the world needs, what you are good at, how you believe you can make a positive difference in the world, and of course, how you can make money. And he says all four of those things are required for a company to really pivot and to pivot successfully with purpose. Now I call this sacred purpose, uh, not from a re religious point of view, but what is sacred to us, what is most important in our lives. Uh, be that family, uh, be that serving others, 
taking care of the sick, whatever it may be, that was my focus. But um, I found it refreshing to hear a CEO of a major company talk in these terms. Mm -hmm. Jim, we've, we've had people sharing in the chat. Can we take a look now? Yeah. I'll stop my share. There we go. So we have Tom sharing that he's been selling hard to keep his team busy. And Corey shared, I was able to keep my employees and allowing them to work remote. And Jeff noted, our corporation has let go of less than 2% of the workforce, 99% are working remote, which I, I would love to hear in the long term, you know, what the vision is when you have 99% of your workforce working remote. I think many businesses um, are juggling how to maintain purpose and have people now connecting virtually everyone as opposed to just select people. And Tim uh, was sharing that they're keeping their team employed and with health benefits. And John, that they've kept everyone on the team, provided all the technology for them to stay at home, ramped up marketing to build opportunities. David has shared, we've added focus to maintain a strong visibility, visibly financial status and to communicate a clear message of where the company's position is to employees. And Meredith, modeling patients every day. <laughs> That's a major task in and of itself. Exactly, exactly. Uh, for anyone who's uh, willing to share, how have your employees responded to, to this shift? Let's where, unmute everybody. About, whoop, where they're hearing about other companies laying off and here, here you're, uh, keeping them on board, you're giving them health insurance. Um, how are they responding? What's, what's their point of view? Well, I, I think I don't have a ton of staff, which is why I like my business. Um, so they've been extremely happy, you know, that obviously, and, and we've had work to keep them busy, so it's great. But I'd also, I've been spending a lot of time in my businesses relocating businesses you know, project managing if they're taking on newspaper or less space. And I've been spending a lot of time on Zoom calls and reading a lot of white papers on answering Linda's question is, you know, how do we think productivity is going to be if people continue to work remote? Um, and just my two cents of what I've gathered is that we all think that our employees or the companies think their employees are on their best behaviors right now working remote because they do not want to be fired or furloughed. But long term, working five days a week from home is probably not good from a productivity standpoint, a synergy standpoint, and a collaboration standpoint. So everything I've been reading and talking to is companies feel that they are probably going to allow their employees to work one or two days remotely and come into the offices, you know, and come into the office and have synergy and whether they do it on phase one and two, so not everyone's in the office at the same time. But that's what I sort of think that they figured remote work works, but not five days a week for the long term. Great, thank you. Any anyone else? So I, I can speak with regards to uh, IOA, the corporation that I work for, and you know, I would concur with what Corey said that it's going to be difficult. We're bringing employees back in, in groups. So it would be not with regards to a specific location, but more specific to their role in the company with the producers such as myself coming in towards the end of July. But we were really able, they did an amazing job in rolling out in a couple of days. Um, uh, we've got about 2,000 employees, including the producers, um, working remote all of a sudden. So they did an amazing job with that. And um, I think we let go of 50 employees out of that total amount. So um, they were receptionists or that sort of stuff. So, you know, it that's what we had to do to keep the, um, the balance of the employees employed. And going forward, I, I, I do agree with Corey. It's going to be interesting to see what happens. I know that 
um, for me, when I'm at work, I've got my wife coming in or what have you, and I can't, I was never set up to work at home, so it's very difficult for me um, to do that. Thanks, Jeff. Jim, I'd love to know your thoughts, you know, with regards to the, the idea of purpose and having teams feel shared purpose. You know, uh, the whole population are not introverts. And so part of creating shared purpose is people feeling like they're in it together. And it's all very sweet that every, everybody is now saying we're all in this together. But that's a great philosophical statement when you talk about organizations needing to achieve a mission. Um, I'd love your thoughts about the reality of having people dispersed working in isolation, even if there's a Zoom call a couple of times a day. I, I agree with Corey that most of the research I've been reading, white papers uh, are saying it's probably not sustainable for most businesses. Uh, my experience in working with teams is they need to be together uh, live uh, for some period of time. Uh, if you look at, at the um, distance learning model that we're gonna see higher ed just really be turned on its head this year. Um, distance learning, they always still bring people back to campus, um, usually twice a year. And I think we're gonna find needs like that uh, will continue to uh, pop up in the business world also. Uh, there's something energetic. I, I find very difficult to even um, speak with Zoom because I can't feel your energy. And I think that that's uh, really an important thing when, when teams are together, you're picking up all sorts of signals uh, that are difficult to pick up on, a, on a, a computer screen. And so it will end up being some, some blend of these. And you know, I think that's part of what we'll find out in this pivot for all of us. It just as a side note, but to me, it absolutely relates to the idea of purpose and proximity is I was on a group discussion uh, Wednesday that was talking about the court system in Los Angeles is looking very seriously at how they can eliminate any reason why people would have to come together. Well, that includes jury trials. They're literally seriously looking at how they could have every juror remote at home. And I'm thinking, depending on the camera, the lighting, what you do and don't see on someone's face and body language is we say, oh, I feel so connected to you because I'm looking at you. It's just not the same. It's just not. And at that point also, you put a mask on a person because that's what's required in the state of California now. So you, you miss so many other cues as to smile, a frown, and all that sort of stuff. So it's really weird where we're at right now. And, I, you know, I, Jim, I'd love to, I, I don't know how long it's going to last or what have you, but it's just, it's an incredibly interesting time. Yeah. Hey, Jim. Yes. Hi, Jeff. How are you, sir? Looking, looking well in your beautiful house, which I have visited. I recommend everybody on the call to go visit Jim. It's a gorgeous place. We all <laughs> go at the same time. <laughs> Uh, a couple of quick thoughts on this. This is a fascinating conversation, by the way. You know, I, I, in my discussion on this, and this has come up a number of times in what I've been doing, this whole idea of how you keep the team together. You know, good old Jean-Jacques Rousseau back, I think, in the 18th century said, man is a social animal. And he meant men and women are social animals, and they interact socially. And that, and that social, socialization comes teams. Uh, I am working in education, and I couldn't agree more with the comment that higher education is going to be turned upside down, uh, and having done both resident and online education, the most effective is, if you do online for economic or geographic reasons, is blended learning where you do bring people physically together. We found at the War College, the sustainment of those students in our online courses were enhanced if they had opportunities to come together because they bonded together and they tended to pull each other along. So there was that physicality was important in them uh, finishing the course. Uh, with colleges right now, I'm curious enough, I was on a call. This is all off the record, right? <laughs> um, I was on a call with the college I'm part of just a few minutes ago. Uh, their biggest concern is while they're thinking about bringing the students back is that the faculty may not want to come back. Mm -hmm. So then yeah. how do you charge somebody a huge amount of tuition for their kid to come back on campus while he or she's still taking three of their five curse courses online? I don't know. As a parent, I think I'd get 
I'd get kind of upset when I got that big tuition uh, bill, you know, in the mail, you know. So that's going to turn the whole thing uh, upside down for education. The final couple points uh, to elaborate on what I think Linda was just suggesting a minute ago. I don't know how you develop your team in terms of things like coaching and mentoring if you stay in this environment. I just don't think it at a minimum becomes very, very hard. I don't know how you establish a mentoring relationship if the only time I see you or have met you is through a Zoom lens. And uh, individuals don't have the opportunity as easily to walk down the hall and tap on their boss or their team leader's door just to have a quick chat, which ends up being a coaching session. And in some things that I've oh, been doing, uh, I found one of the problems is big Zoom meetings, and then people tell me I don't have a chance, I don't have a time to uh, talk to my boss. Mm -hmm. So I've actually suggested some of my clients, you might need to do what we used to do in college, and that is establish office hours, mm -hmm. where you tell all your employees, you know, from two to three on Tuesday afternoon, I'll be at this phone number doing some basic sort of admin work. If you need to call me or Zoom me or Skype me or whatever, you know, smoke signals, whatever, uh, to talk about anything, I'm available to you because we don't have that opportunity to walk down the hall and, and knock on your door and just see how you're doing. And then the last thing is, I think that um, there's a certain amount of fatigue that I think is, is uh, I think, physically much more prevalent in doing this type of interaction, teaching, discussion, you know, the, the phrase Zoom fatigue, I, I really feel. Mm -hmm. And after I've done about two or three of the meetings like this a day, I'm about, I'm about wasted, you know, yeah. which I don't feel nearly that, that way if I'm just doing it, you know, phys physically. So I think there's something else we've got to keep in mind. Sorry to draw it on. Um, thank you, Jeff. Uh, Jeff is a, a colleague and a, a good friend. And I'll just tell a little story. Jeff is a, now a retired colonel uh, in the Army. Uh, but I first met him when he was the academic dean at the Army War College. And my first contact with Jeff was a, a phone call. And um, I asked him, how do you lead in chaos? And he said, hell, that's easy. Values, mission, and goals. And from there, uh, my consulting career uh, incorporated uh, Jeff and the War College and Gettysburg as a classroom. Uh, wow. So, um, interesting that we're here we all are today okay well then i got to do a quick rejoinder okay because <laughs> it, <laughs> everything i'm doing now is because jim davis made that phone call and then dragged me into didn't drag me he convinced me to work with him on a project with teachers college at columbia university and i wouldn't be doing now if jim hadn't made that phone call i will tell everybody on the call when he called me up identified who he was and said he needed to come to the war college to talk about you know leadership development and I, have, have you ever had a phone call where you have the phone like this and the person asks you a really weird question and you take the phone and you look like that? Well, that's exactly <laughs> what I did. <laughs> <laughs> and I put the phone back up to my ear and I said, hey, look, man, this is the Army War College. You know, he, you're coming from. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, yeah, I understand all that, but uh, I've, been a, I've been a principal and a superintendent in, in inner city school districts in Los Angeles. It's about as close to combat as you get without going outside the United States. And so I said, okay, hell man, come on out. And that's how our friendship began. <laughs> well, just to jump in right here, and that is that Jeff's gonna be one of our speakers uh, on the 21st of something, I think that's right, 21st of July on, uh, and learn, teaching some of the things that uh, he discusses at the War College. So I hope you'll all join us on that. But back to you, Jim. Exactly. John's got a question, but I think it'll be perfect on the other side of the rest of your slides. Okay. Let's go back. Let's see if I can do this. I, just as you go back to work, uh, think about how, how can you reconnect those employees to purpose uh, and, and what I heard a common theme among you uh, is you tried to keep your employees in place and what a great purpose that is. Uh, and to, to really allow them to connect to the fact that you ran your business, you pivoted during these times uh, in very difficult times in a way that took care of them and took care of their families. And um, 
you saw them as a source of success for your companies, not as a resource to be let go. And I think that's a, a, a key thing to remind them of that that purpose was very important to you. Um, it, I, I think I've got several examples in, of, of companies uh, that have pivoted and done a good job of it during this COVID. And I think I'd like to share those with you now, uh, but I'm also cognizant, I wanna make sure we have enough time at the end uh, to have more discussion. So how are we doing on time? We're doing fine. Okay, great. 10 more minutes and then questions. So don't, you know, keep rolling. Okay, great. Uh, the first company is called Brascom America, and it's the largest petrochemical plant in the United States. And I, I had never heard of it until I saw an article uh, written about them. Uh, they uh, have plants, uh, as I said, across the country, but their leadership team became alarmed as they saw the shortage of PPE, the personal protective equipment, uh, as they watched the news, and they felt the need to do something about it. Now they can produce polypropylene, uh, and that's one of the major ingredients in almost all PPE, be it masks, face shields, et cetera, the gowns people wear. Uh, and they decided to convert one of their plants, this one was in Pennsylvania, to full-time production of polypropylene and to do that quickly. Uh, however, they were dealing with the issue, how do we protect our employees? If our employees are coming into work on public transportation, uh, getting there any way they can, they're exposed to the virus and then they therefore expose their coworkers and they expose their families. Um, and so what they did is ask for volunteers to live in isolation in the company's factory for a month. Now think about that. Amazingly, they got 43 people who volunteered. And those 43 uh, were tested. They did not have COVID. They moved in uh, in March of this year uh, for the longest shift uh, any of them had ever run, 28 days. Um, they converted offices, and this is what you see here, into bedrooms. Uh, it didn't go smoothly at first because who's cooking, who's cleaning, who's doing what, but they figured it out. Uh, the plant operated for 24-7 uh, um, uh, for 28 days. And during that time, and I've got to read it here, these volunteers produced 40 million pounds of polypropylene, and that's enough for 500 million N95 masks or 1.5 billion surgical masks. Uh, the volunteers didn't do this for money. They were paid well, but they didn't do it for money. They volunteered in order to serve not only their local community, but the country as a whole, doing something they felt was important. They did it for purpose. Um, uh, so Brascom saw this, this need. They pivoted the company. They shut down in this factory all of the other lines in order to focus on PPE. Uh, and um, they built an amazing reputation within their community, uh, pride among their employees and their employees' families, uh, and it served the bottom line of the company because they didn't give that polypropylene away. Uh, so it's an example where keeping purpose at the forefront in a time where you needed to pivot uh, uh, pays off at the bottom line, but also had long, uh, a long lasting effect on the, the pride the employees had in the company. And they are now uh, getting ready to convert another factory into another 28-day uh, live-in party, I guess. Uh, and so we've seen a lot of stories like these. Uh, Ford has done slick advertising about converting uh, some of their, their uh, workforce into producing face shields and, and uh, ventilators. Uh, a second example is HEB. And it's a large grocery chain in Texas out, outside of San Antonio. Uh, the, the president of HEB describes the company as, as purpose-driven, uh, and especially uh, that includes taking care of Texas. It is a very Texas-oriented company. Um, they um, had been following the crisis in Wuhan since January. Now imagine, this is a grocery chain, uh, but they followed it uh, uh, very, very closely. 
they contacted grocers in Wuhan and they asked what kinds of problems they were having, what was going on. And uh, they modeled that for their uh, area they cover in, in Texas. And in February of this year, February 1st, they dusted off a pandemic plan that they had in place since, uh, since the uh, uh, N1H1 virus hit. Now imagine that, a grocery chain had a plan. I wish some other people had a plan. Um, and uh, then on March 1st, they opened their emergency operations center. Um, and that's what this is a picture of. This is in San Antonio. And so uh, by monitoring what was going on in Wuhan, by monitoring what was going on in their service area, uh, they almost immediately, early in March, began limiting certain products that their customers were able to buy. And that was from the, the research they had done with grocers in Wuhan. Uh, they extended their sick leave policy for employees. They implemented social distancing very quickly. They limited hours so that their stockers could keep up uh, with stocking the shelves. Uh, they added a coronavirus hotline for their employees, and they gave a $2 an hour raise in mid-March because they finally realized that the employees were very worried, so they saw that as hazard pay. Now, they didn't do this perfectly. Uh, they admit that the raise really came after employees started complaining. But if you look at the overall picture, uh, it was tied to that idea of being a purpose-driven entity. And they had had a history of serving Texas and Texans through hurricanes, floods, et cetera. And they just put that same purpose together again to serve the larger community during this time. Uh, the, the third uh, company um, is called Cosmic. It's, it's, it's just a seven person design and branding firm. Uh, and it's uh, operated for the last, uh, I think they opened in 2010, for the last 10 years in a, one of those very cool offices in downtown Santa Cruz. It's the kind where you bring your dogs to work. Uh, they've got beer on tap at the end of the day, uh, the great team spirit. Uh, and they were an integral part of the community of Santa Cruz, sponsoring chamber uh, of commerce get togethers once a month. However, the pandemic provided them an opportunity to pivot, and it's something that the team had wanted to do for a long time. They really wanted to move out of the normal uh, branding kind of, of business and move to um, more service-oriented companies uh, that they could serve. And Eric, the founder of the company, <clears throat> and his team decided that this was the perfect time to do so. Uh, they had to begin working remotely anyway, uh, Eric got a tough shed in his backyard and that became his office. Uh, he's also a new father. And so it was a time for him to pivot his company as well uh, as his personal life. Uh, so that they're now serving only uh, uh, companies that serve a greater purpose. And at the same time, uh, each of the team members can service um, or can serve their own families uh, in, a, in a better way. Um, this is how they now define themselves, a cosmic, a social impact creative agency, uh, a team aligned by purpose, and uh, their goal is to build teams that move humanity forward. Now, an important part of this is that these are all millennials. And uh, so often many of us, uh, in my age group at least, uh, don't always have a positive feeling about millennials. I, I don't feel that way. I, I like working with them. Um, but this idea of purpose runs deep in the general millennial, uh, in the millennial generation. Uh, and the more your company is aligned to purpose, uh, the more successful you'll be, I believe, in attracting millennial employees. And remember, those employees also are going to be future customers. And so these things are very important uh, as you pivot your team, as you, if you can bring purpose along with that pivot uh, and articulate it authentically, uh, I think that you'll, you'll find you're, you're building a more successful company for today, but also for the future. Um, the last one I wanna share is Lysol. And th this is an advertisement from uh, 1918. Um, 
and Lysol was around when the Spanish flu was around. And I, I found this example was very interesting. Um, one of the workers who had been there for 24 years and maintains the machines, uh, he, he was um, an immigrant from Italy, um, really didn't think much of his job, but he came home one day and his daughter said to him, dad, you're saving the world. And that's because everything they saw on the news was about Lysol disinfectant, Lysol wipes, et cetera. And she saw his, his work as something that was very important. And that convinced him that for the first time in his life, uh, he said, I feel like I have a purpose in going to work. Now, Lysol, uh, I, I filled that purpose prior to COVID. And so their, their uh, issue will be going forward. How do they continue to have that sense of purpose among their employees? or do they just go back to the, the way they were before? Um, so the COVID, as they pivoted to producing only Lysol disinfectant, because they also make easy off oven cleaner, easy on spray on starch, uh, they, they pivoted the whole company to produce disinfectant. Um, and that brought those employees along, the employees uh, felt connected to purpose, they need to find a way to continue that going forward. Um, I think what I want to do now is give you some lessons for leaders and then we'll, we'll open it up for discussion again. Um, when faced with the need to pivot, revisit your purpose. How can you use the pivot as an opportunity to close any gaps between your purpose and the values and the way you run your business? Or uh, it's a great opportunity to also think about your family. And can you use that pivot as an opportunity uh, to, uh, to close a gap with family? Uh, let purpose, not fear, drive the pivot. Um, remember that pivoting provides motivation for you, your employees, and your customers if it's done authentically. People can, can sense when things are just done um, uh, for surface reasons. It needs to be authentic. Um, always see your employees as a source of your success, not a resource to be used. Um, I remember one of my clients, he, he just saw everybody as uh, a cog in a wheel, including me as a consultant. Um, but that led to the eventual uh, lack of success for that client. Uh, be clear about the purpose and what this focus on purpose means uh, for you, the company, your employees, uh, customers, uh, vendors, very important to, to keep them in mind. And then is there a fit between your personal purpose, that of your employees, and the purpose of the company? I think if we keep those, those uh, bullets in mind, it'll help us through the, the current crises we're facing, uh, but also help to build a stronger company, stronger business as we go forward. So, other comments? That's great. I'd love for John Thompson to come on live and share the question he was posing a little while ago. Right. Uh, sure. Thanks, Linda. Right. So, you know, I, this it's wonderful pieces. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge expertise, Jim. It's really great. Um, you know, I was thinking about this sort of disconnect that you mentioned earlier on between sort of personal values and sort of your work life and what's going on there. And, and how do you kind of step back? What was your process? You did that, you know, I think you said in two weeks, which is amazing, right? You, you know, I'm, I'm a slow learner. <laughs> so uh, the idea of completely pivoting and abandoning a career of that length and then moving away in two weeks, I just find it fascinating. So what was your process you went through? How did you explore that? Well, the, the process wasn't two, two weeks. The process was well over a year and probably ah. more. Um, and it was just, I woke up one day and said, I am not happy. I, that's truthfully what happened. And I started to really examine what was going on in my life. And that unhappiness was about 60 to 70% of my day was spent doing BS in my mind. Yeah. And I, I uh, when negotiating with two unions um, and that's hours a week. Uh, it seemed like it was an ongoing uh, problem. Um, trying to convince people 
uh, when you're in education, it's true in the many businesses, everybody knows more about education because they all went to school. <laughs> and so they know how to do your job. Um, and uh, that's not true. So you're, you're in a constant political battle, constantly. Um, people either love you or they think you're the devil. So, uh, so all of those things really started to ring home. And I do try to live my life by those four values I listed. They're very important to me. And um, it, get, it gets hard to sometimes be compassionate <laughs> uh, with people who are acting a certain way. It's hard to be respectful. Uh, I think I did that fairly well uh, uh, during my years in, in the field. Uh, but it was time to, to move on. And um, it, it was a risk. Um, now, I, my wife at the time was working, uh, but the risk got greater because uh, two years later she died and I lost mm. two thirds of her income. Um, but it was still worth it. And I've said to everybody, I've never looked back and regretted the move. Uh, but it's, it was no fear. Keep focusing on the purpose, keep focusing on the, my values and put together uh, a life that would support those things. Great, and Meredith has got a question for you as well. Let me double check. Meredith, let's uh, go ahead and unmute. So rarely does anyone ask me to unmute. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so Jim, back to your old days, because I'm still back in your old days. And by the way, I'm a, one of the board members. I think I was the board president well, when when Jim had his transformation and, um, and I am still his friend. So um, I don't always understand him, but I'm definitely his friend. Um, here's my question as a person who still works in public education with unions. It's a very different situation to motivate teachers as Jim was who wanted to be around students and direct instruction and learning environment when everything is remote. So what would you do if you were back as a superintendent with a, in a public sector with unions? Well, first of all, we, we wouldn't be in the position where we'd never done it before. Uh, and I think this has got to be true a, across the board with businesses. Uh, we knew the pandemic was coming. The, the, there was an alert to this pandemic in 2015. Uh, the national security strategy talks about pandemics. That Donald Trump's national security strategy published in 2017 talked about it. Um, we had experience of it with students with special needs Back before we had the internet, we were trying to do things with the local cable company so that we could serve them. So I would have been in a position where we anticipated that we were going to need to do remote learning and we would have had the equipment, we would have had opportunities to practice that. And uh, you bring the unions along uh, best you can. We, and I, I felt like we did a good job of that in La Cunada, but personally, it, it took a toll. Um, one of the things I always said when I left was I never wanted to have another employee, uh, and I never did. I, um, I have colleagues, but I never had an employee again because um, I'm not answering your question, Meredith. Well, let me, let me narrow it. Maybe it was a poorly worded question. How about... Um, how, forget the union, the side issue of education. How do you take an employee and remind them of the company's purpose in order to continue to motivate them despite chaos around them that makes them unhappy or unmotivated? Well, I, I think that becomes a part of the, the review process. Uh, one of the things I always ask my employees is, is um, why are you doing what you're doing? Reminding them of that. Uh, working with, with teams as a consultant, uh, why are you doing what you're doing? Uh, it's going to th that why. 
we, we focus so much on the what we're doing, uh, but we don't often remember why we're doing it. And it's reconnecting them with purpose. Um, I'll give a, a quick example. This is a school example, so I hate to, to do that with all of our business folks online, but um, I was working with a team in a, a school district in the San Gabriel Valley, uh, a leadership team of, of teachers. And um, I put up a set of data uh, about student achievement. Now we had just gone through a whole thing about what are their values, uh, what is their purpose. And I then put up the data and the data showed that the, the students, especially students of color were doing horrible. And I said, so what are the values of, of the school district? They didn't know it was their data. And they said, it's horrible. How could they treat these kids like that? How could they have um, um, uh, such disparity between uh, the white kids, or brown kids, and black kids? And then I showed whose data it was, theirs. And actually, uh, half of the team burst into tears. And so it, it's having those discussions, connecting people to purpose and keeping them connected to purpose and that becomes so important. Uh, and that's why with the Lysol example, that company needs to find a way to keep those, those employees connected to the, the larger purpose uh, beyond getting a paycheck. And I, I, I feel strongly about that. Yeah, thank you, Jim. And uh, Tom, make sure you're unmuted because I know you've got something you want to share. Uh, real quick, does Hema, do you have something you want to share before I jump in? Because I know you have to go. Yeah, I no, I've got to go soon, but I, I'm, I am passionate about this topic because I work with um, a variety of, um, variety of clients, but my staff is also, also a challenge for me as well because everyone's remote. Um, and one of the things that we, I have to always keep in mind is the generations and talking to the different generations. The millennials have a different style that we need to stroke their, stroke their, motivational side and then you've got the gen y's and then you've got the baby boomers and i think i think the, talking about the values that you bring up jim i think it's really critical to communicate that and incentivize it by by that generation uh, I, th I think we have four generations in the workforce right now yes uh it's interesting and and i find that with my younger ones my millennials, the ones that are younger than me, um, I'm not telling you my age, but they're quite happy doing the iChat, you know, and working, that's how they would knock on my door, you know, um, like that other gentleman Jeffrey was talking about. You just walk down the hallway and knock on the door. They knock on the door with an iMessenger with me on, on, on Google Chat. And they're quite happy doing that. And the, the, the productivity has just actually increased um, by being remote. Then I've got the the ones that are older than me <laughs> and and they, they are struggling with this whole remote situation and they want to meet in person in fact yesterday one of my clients says him i'm done zoom zooming with you uh can we please meet in person and i hope i didn't offend you i said i welcome it with open arms and when i went in they were all set up for it they had a you know a, a divider and everything everything else. So I think it's really important to keep that in mind because the younger ones think very differently. Absolutely. Hey Jim, if I could jump in for a second, just to I totally agree with what she just said. Some of the research I've suggest, seen though comes back to your point. And that is if you do surveys of uh, millennials and Gen Z, the whole idea of purpose seems to resonate a little bit higher with them than with old baby boomers like me and Gen Xers, you know, uh, it does seem to be the case. That seems to be the case. And I'm one of the corporations I'm working with right now is a fast food industry, frankly. Uh, and they've uh, shifted over to a lot of uh, home delivery as opposed to people coming in for, to restaurant dining. Uh, and when they told me that one of the things that helped them a lot was the workforce who is by and large younger, I would say not, not totally, but a lot of probably the majority are millennials or even Gen Z people. Uh, found purpose in this because they were delivering food to families who then did not have to go out in the community to get it, you know, and therefore mm -hmm. keeping them in a safer environment, number one. Number two, they realized that families were having the opportunity to dine together, particularly in the evening, 
which before the pandemic, they didn't get a chance to do that because mom and dad were on different schedules and everyone's on 14 schedules. So one of the odd, if you almost say benefits of the pandemic was an opportunity for the family to dine together and they were contributing to that. So in an odd way, that seemed to give them a greater sense of purpose, but it does seem to me at least to be a bit more important for the younger generations than the older generations. Tom, you had something you wanted to share. Well, just real quick, and that is that I went through a, <clears throat> a little bit of a, crisis is the wrong word, but a reshuffling of my views three years ago. And um, just to make the point, I went to a number of consultants and it really wasn't sticking with me until I went back to my why. And it took me about six months. Meredith was very gracious and allowed me to spend that time. But I had to go back to my why before I could re re-energize myself in my business. So I think the why is super important, Jim. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Uh, so um, we're hitting up against nine o'clock uh, and I always like to keep my meetings on time. So I wanna thank everybody for coming. Jim, uh, once again, a great presentation. I think everybody enjoyed it. Um, I'm going to have a, uh, the video uh, online if people wanna see this and I'll also get some notes up there so you can see a, a, a quick review of what was discussed. So if people Jim, would like to reach Jim, how would they go about that? Um, Email is the best way, jdavis at davisgroupltd.net. And Jerry would like to say something. Jerry, weigh in, my friend. Uh, I just kind of have a question. I mean, you know, uh, manufacturing in California, it seems like we're constantly pivoting and it gets to be overwhelming at times. Um, you know, on, and you can almost lose sight of, of uh, purpose. It's kind of like, you know, by myself, I'd say it's sometimes, you know, it's the forest and the trees. You, you just, you, you can't see the whole picture. A lot of times I'll try and bring people in that may be kind of thinking a little bit like me, uh, but maybe other talents, uh, other areas of expertise and how to move in certain directions and do that. But, you know, with the, uh, the purpose, the goals and all that, I mean, the way you had it set up, it, it works nice, but it seems like there's so many other dynamics happening at the same time to, to put that into a nice uh, uh, form like you've got it almost uh, seems impossible, I guess, at times. So, I mean, how do you go about that uh, when you, you just hit in so many different directions? Uh, and I guess it, gets, it becomes rather unclear at times. I, I think especially, Jerry, with a company like yours, um, you know, you're not making disinfectant. Uh, it's, it's harder for the employees to see the, the broader picture. So I think it comes down to your personal purpose. And um, I know that, that you, you've cared deeply about your employees and their families. And so if, if that becomes kind of the purpose of the company also is to build a team that understands that your purpose flows through the company uh, through them to their families. And uh, that, that may be the, the greater good that you're serving as a manufacturing company. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. Yes. Thank All you. right. With that, uh, Jim, thanks again. And uh, everybody, uh, we'll see you next week. We've got a great talk led by uh, Linda Feinholz here. So uh, on uh, the art of the pivot on the practical side. So anyway, thank you very much and have a good day. Happy Father's Day to everybody. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Tom.